The gospel was given to the Gentiles. The Jews rejected Jesus. That's why they were in bondage by the Babylonians. So here in the prayer, Daniel is coming along. He says, you know what, God, we have sinned. You got, you got to really listen to us because we need you. You notice that he says in verse 2, in the first year of the reign of I, Daniel, understood the books, which means what? He was reading the scriptures. Man, how important it is to read the Bible. So important. I cannot emphasize it more and more than tonight. Because without the reading of God's Word, you have no sense of direction. You have no voice of God in your life. You're not developing, you're not growing, you have no, uh, no defense in your life. And one thing I've learned from Daniel, that he was a man of prayer, a man of the Word, and a man of his saints. That's the kind of person I want to be in my life. I hope you do too. Well, tonight we have probably one of the greatest chapters in the Bible. This is my favorite uh, chapter because he's going to be speaking about the past, the present, and then of the future. Daniel chapter 9. If you have your Bibles turned there, Lord, I ask you tonight, Jesus, that you give me your wisdom. Father, concerning this chapter, Lord, and Father, that you reveal to us how close you really are to your coming, Lord. Father, give us an urgency, Lord. To know you more each day, Father. Praying for our children, our grandchildren, Lord God, for the body of Christ, for this world, Lord God. And Lord, for the presidency, Lord God, for government, Jesus. Lord, we want righteous people, Lord. And Lord, I pray that you continue to lead this church. And Lord, we pray for all the churches surrounding us, Lord. And Lord, across America, God, and all over the world, Jesus. Lord, keep us simple. Lord, keep us active in your kingdom, Lord. So, Lord, we thank you so much for this time, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, Lord. Amen. Well, Daniel chapter 9. Let me kind of just give you a little introduction. I wrote a bunch of stuff down so you can uh, kind of hear what's, where we're heading this evening. But we want to focus our attention tonight completely on chapter 9. And the reason for that is because Daniel, he came from Israel. When he came to Babylon, he was 15 years old. Now he's close to 85 years old. And God has spoken to him that he would go to Babylon for 70 years. And probably 68 years now have come to pass. And Daniel's standing there, he's thinking, well, you know, we've been here 68 years, and God said 70 years, so we're pretty close to not only going home, but to the end of that prophecy. Now, we'll see in a moment, we're going to go through Daniel's prayer. It's, it's an amazing, amazing prayer. We need to learn from it. Because it doesn't talk about Daniel sinning, but Daniel will say, I have sinned in the presence of God. You'll see in a moment. He's one of my favorites in the Old Testament, too. But we see Daniel here in this chapter as a man of prayer. If you want to write this down, a man of prayer. He's also a man of the word and also a man of his times. I like those three things, prayer, word, and times. I think that in these last days, we need more pastors like that. We need pastors that are praying, that they are in the Word, and that they are not only looking to the future, but looking at their own times as these are our own times. Somebody asked me the other day, well, what do I think about the coming of the Lord? Well, I've been, I've been waiting for Him for the last 40-some years, and He hasn't come. But that doesn't discourage me, because it's never my timing, it's God's timing. And I shared before on Sunday mornings that one of the great areas that Paul the Apostle shares with us, he said, we've been having for the last 1900 plus years, we've been under the grace of God, started with Babylon and all to the present time. We're literally in God's grace. But one of these days, it's going to close. When that closes, the Bible says there's a generation, they will never die. And that generation will be the generation that will be raptured to heaven. And once we're taken out of the way, then the Antichrist will make his way into this world. And those people that are left behind, I feel sorry for them. 
Because even though they're going to die in the tribulation, it shows you they were never ready before the tribulation period was coming. Some of them will be those that you share with, family members, friends. They make fun of you. They listen to you, but they don't really believe. But once it takes place, husbands come home, wives gone, kids are gone. Husbands gone, kids are gone, or whoever it is, and you hear on the radio or television, something has just happened in the world. All these people have disappeared. The UFOs finally came. <laughs> I don't believe in UFOs. Those are angels, man. <laughs> I'm always fine with my wife and Ryan. They go, did you see that? I say, see what? That flying thing? I say, Ryan, I think you're still on drugs. <laughs> But imagine Daniel. I mean, here Daniel's in Babylon. He's, he's right in the midst of what God's going to say, and yet he comes to that place where he says, I'm going to pray first. He doesn't give a prophecy. He spends time with God. So we begin here in chapter 9, verse 1, where he receives his vision. Remember, in the year 539 and 532 B.C., he says, in the first year of Darius, the son of Ahasuerus, of the line of the Medes, who was made king over the realm of the Chaldeans. Daniel was approximately 15 years old, I told you at the beginning, and now he's about 81 to 85 years of age. He knows that 68 years have come, and there's two more years, 70 years. Now, we know exactly why they were in Babylon. They had disobeyed the Sabbaths of the Lord. For every Sabbath they disobeyed, 490 years, we'll see in a moment, they had to go over to Babylon for 70 years. Because God said, you did not keep my Sabbaths. You know, people ask me all the time, well, you think the Sabbath, or you think that, you know, keeping Sunday morning is very important. Really, it's not about Saturday, Sunday, Monday, too. Every day is a Sabbath for me. The Bible teaches that we need to have one day of rest. One day of rest. Many people work on Sunday morning, so that's, that condemn them from not coming to church. Of course not. You can not only miss church, but you can make up for it because not only you're trying to make a living for yourself, but the next day or the following day, every single day you can get up and have church in your life. You have to be careful not to get condemned by people. Understanding that God has called you and nobody can condemn you. God is the one that convicted you. He's the one that brought you to himself. And he's the one that is using your life to bring glory and honor to his name. Just like Daniel. He says in verse 2, he says, The first year of his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books the number of the years specified by the word of the Lord through the prophet Jeremiah that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolation of Jerusalem. So they had not given the land 490 years rest. So here God is saying to them, for every single year, you're going to pay it back to me. You can read Jeremiah chapter 25, verse 11 through 18, about the 70 years. Jeremiah 29, 10, he explains to you that too. But also the 70 years that they were not only looking forward to. That during the 70 years, God had told them, remember when they went to Babylon, hey, if you submit and you do what's cool, you're going to be okay in Babylon. But if you don't submit and you make a big deal about it, you're not going to make it. This is where the Jews where the Jews went to Babylon and they learned from farming to become the greatest business people in the whole world, in Babylon. Remember, they were farmers. And who are the greatest businessmen today? The Jews are. Go to New York City. I mean, they sell diamonds. They, I mean, they're just incredible businesses. And here God not only gives them an opportunity to recognize, him, hey, you guys, you go, and I'm going to release you in 70 years. Now, when God released them in 70 years, 47,500 returned back to Jerusalem. When they returned back to Jerusalem, remember, Jerusalem was all the way destroyed. 
because of the Babylonians. That's when Nehemiah is written. We'll get that in a moment. The book of Nehemiah was written where Nehemiah was not only, you know, in, in Persia with King Ahasuerus, and in chapter 2 of the book of Nehemiah, in chapter 1, he begins to pray because he gets a report from his brothers that Jerusalem is a mess. They have no defense. The enemy is mocking him constantly. So he prays to God, and God gives him permission to go back to Jerusalem. He'd never been there before. The king gives him horses. He gives him people, gives him money, and he goes for 12 years there in Jerusalem. And you figure... That when that commandment was given to Nehemiah was March 14, 45 B.C. In chapter 2 of Nehemiah to go. And we'll get this in a moment. But I'm getting a little ahead of myself. <laughs> I can't help it. But remember when Jesus entered into the city of Jerusalem. On a donkey there were waving palms. Saying, Hosanna, Hosanna. At that particular moment, the 483 years were fulfilled of 490 years, which is an amazing prophecy. People will ask, well, how long do we have? Seven years. Seven years till the end comes. The church is still here. So for 1,900 years, almost 2,000 years, the church has been living under the grace of God. The gospel was given to the Gentiles. The Jews rejected Jesus. That's why they were in bondage by the Babylonians. So here in the prayer, Daniel is coming along. He says, you know what, God, we have sinned. You've got, you got to really listen to us because we need you. You notice that he says in verse 2, in the first year of the reign of I, Daniel, understood the books, which means what? He was reading the scriptures. Man, how important it is to read the Bible. So important. I cannot emphasize it more and more than tonight. Because without the reading of God's word, you have no sense of direction. You have no voice of God in your life. You're not developing. You're not growing. You have no, um, no defense in your life. And one thing I've learned from Daniel, that he was a man of prayer, a man of the word, and a man of his saints. That's the kind of person I want to be in my life. I hope you do too. Because Daniel, as he prays, you'll see the books number, the years. But then he says, says by Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish how many years? Seventy years in the desolation of Jerusalem. Seventy years are there. Sixty-eight years, two more years are left. Jeremiah, here again, Daniel is asking God. Verse 3. And I set my face toward the Lord God to make requests by prayer. Notice that. He sets himself aside to seek the Lord. How? Through prayer and fasting. You'll see in a moment. Through prayer and fasting, waiting upon God's word for God to speak to him. So he says this. Then I, Daniel, set my face to the Lord God to make requests by prayer, supplications, and fasting, and sackcloth, and ashes. Pretty amazing. Pretty amazing, Daniel. As I was reading this, something caught my eye that he sets his face toward Jerusalem. Toward the east. They always set their face toward the east, Jerusalem. And when Daniel set his face toward the east, he says he was making a request. He's praying. Uh, he has supplications. But then fasting is a time where you deny yourself. You don't eat. If you have physical problems or, you know, you have to get a note from your physician, go ahead. But don't fast unless your physician says you can fast because you can ruin your life. But I think that when you fast and pray, there's something special about that. Not that you want to be self-righteous or more spiritual. But I think it's a time of separation. A time to spend with God as I open the scriptures. I've been fasting, I'm praying, and God is speaking. Does that mean that if I don't fast, God won't speak to me? Not, that's not what I said. The special times that I feel in my life that I need to pray and I need to fast. Because there's power in that. 
And remember when, when Nehemiah, in chapter 1 of Nehemiah, when his brothers came and told him about the condition of Jerusalem, what did he do? He wept, he prayed, and he put on sackcloth and ashes. He was so hurt by it. A picture of denying and emptying yourself before God. A picture of denial. I set my face to the Lord God to make requests by prayer, supplications, with fastings, in sackcloth, and ashes. Then he says in verse 4, now he starts his prayer of confession, if you want to write that down. He says, I, Daniel, prayed to the Lord my God. Notice, personal relationship with God. The word God here is the name God is used seven times in Daniel, but only in this chapter, seven times, which means Jehovah. He says in chapter 9, verse 2, uh, uh, verse 4, verse 8, verse 10, 13, and 14. Uh, you can get the CD up pretty fast. You can slow it down. Chapter 9, verse 2, verse 4, verse 8, verse 10, 13, and 14. Then he says this, because we're starting in chapter 9, verse 4, the uh, worship time. Now verse 5. He says, we have sinned and committed iniquity. You notice the first thing he starts with? We have sinned against you, God. He doesn't start praying. He wants to make sure he clears the way with God. He clears the way with God. Lord, the first thing that I want to let you know is that we have sinned against you. He puts himself with the people, not self-righteous. Lord, I with the people have sinned. And sin always separates me from God. But we notice here that, that, that Daniel does not blame God for anything concerning the judgment of God. It's like, Lord, you know, it's your judgment against us because you don't love us. He doesn't do that. He says what? We have sinned and committed iniquity. We have done wickedly and rebelled even by departing from your precepts and your judgments. Away from the word of God. Away from God's word. Not reading it and not living by it. Verse 6. Neither have we listened to your servants, the prophets. They had ignored the message of the prophets. They had ignored it. You know, you go back to the book of Judges, chapter 2, verse 10, and there arose that generation that did not know the Lord. Once their parents and grandparents died, you have to go back to Joshua 24, that the sons and the daughters and the grandkids, they were born to them. They all turned their back on God. And they worship Baal, Ashtoreth, and all these gods of the Old Testament. You know, I, I pray for my kids every day. I pray for my grandkids. I know that I'm not going to be here a long time. And I know that one day they're going to grow up in this world. The Lord tarries, he doesn't come. In 45 years, I've seen the change in this world. Can you imagine with modern technology, where we're going to be in the next 50 years if the Lord tarries? where even robots will be used, you know, as people. You've been watching these programs, man, modern technology. But then for us as Christians, we must never forget, like he said here, neither have we listened to your servant, the prophets, who spoke in your name to our kings and our leaders. But they didn't listen to our fathers and all the people of the land, which means there's no excuse. You talk to everybody, God. You told everybody what was going to happen. It's in your word. But they did not listen. The message of the prophets. Verse 7. He now describes the uh, consequences of those people that were in, in Babylon. He says, O oh Lord, righteousness belongs to you. But to us, shame of face. Isn't that incredible? Shame of face. We're embarrassed, Lord for what we have done. As it is this day, to the men of Judah, to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, and all Israel, those near and those afar off, in all the countries to which you have driven them, because of the unfaithfulness which they have committed against you. Wow. In all the countries of the world, why? Because they were unfaithful to God. 
even to the present time. God brought them back to the land, but you notice that God's going to come again. They're going to worship the Antichrist because they don't really believe that the Mashiach has come. They think that he's coming again. And the Antichrist will play the role of the Mashiach for about seven years, and then the end will come. He says again, those near and those afar off of all the countries to which you have driven them because of the unfaithfulness that they have committed against you. So the reason for judgment, unfaithfulness. And that's always the case, being unfaithful to God. Verse 8, O Lord, to us belongs shame of faith. You notice how simple he is, but how he is really pouring his heart out to God for him and the people. Lord, we are so embarrassed. I'm ashamed of myself. To our kings, to our princes, and our fathers, because we have sinned against you. To the Lord our God belongs mercy and forgiveness, though we have rebelled against him. He speaks about rebellion, sin. I mean, all these things that the people had done from the past to the present, and then look into the future, what would take place. Daniel was a man of prayer. A man that loved his people. A man that wanted things right with God. A man that believed the word of God. 67 years are up. Three more years, Lord, where are we going to be in three years? You said 70 years, so there's three years left. And God speaks to him. You'll see in a moment. Verse 10 again. We have not obeyed the voice of the Lord. There's their problem. Our God. To walk in his laws, which he said before us, by his servants, the prophets. You see, going back to all the prophets from previous times. Daniel says here, we are guilty of disobeying you, O oh God. You gave us your word, and we didn't listen to your word. And we regret it now that we did not listen to your word. Verse 11. Here Daniel had been reading from the word of God. He says, yes. All Israel has transgressed your law. Transgression is a willful act. They did it willfully. We have transgressed your law, have departed so as not to obey your voice. I, I said before, if you don't read the Bible, you'll never hear God's voice. Look what he says. Yes, all Israel has transgressed your law and has departed so as not to obey your voice. Therefore, the curse and the oath written in the law of Moses, the servant of God, have been poured out on us because we have sinned against him. You notice how many times sin, 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 sin. He keeps mentioning it. This word of God comes to pass because God said it, God will do it. Verse 12, he says that he has confirmed his words which he spoke against us and against our judges who judged us and bringing upon us the great disaster for under the whole heaven such has never been done as what has been done to Jerusalem. You ever have this prayer like this? You ever pray that long? I mean, this guy is praying and praying and praying, asking God to forgive him, to forgive them. I like the way he starts in verse 12, he says, he says, and he has confirmed his words which he spoke against us and against our judges who judge us, who are judging them. Verse 13, as it is written in the law of God, of Moses, all this disaster has come upon us, notice, yet we have not made our prayer before the Lord our God that we might turn or repent from our iniquities and understand your truth. You cannot understand God's truth if you don't repent from your sins. That's what Daniel's saying here. He's talking about sin. That what they have done, unless they're repentance, they will never ever understand what God says. And that is true so many times within the church that he says here that we might turn from our iniquities and understand your truth. You think about how many people come here on Sunday mornings. Over the last, what, some 40 years in West Covina, back in the Kung Fu studio, all these areas, sometimes I ask the Lord, Lord, where are all those people today? 
Oh, I know many of them have served the Lord, but what happens to those that are no longer serving the Lord for the last 40 years? Where are they today? What's going to happen to them tomorrow? Where are they going to be in the future when it comes to dying and to stand before the presence of the Lord and give an account of our lives before the Lord? That's why it's important to feed upon God's Word. It's important to fellowship with one another. It's important to listen to the Holy Spirit as a teaching of the Word of God so God can speak to me directly, not to my neighbor, but to me personally. I want to hear what God says to me personally because I want to make the change in my life. This is Daniel, the way he's praying. Verse 13, he says again, It is written in the law of Moses, all the disasters have come upon us, yet we have not made a prayer before the Lord our God that we might turn from our iniquities and understand your truth. Verse 14, therefore, the Lord has kept, notice, the disaster in mind. That's why you're in Babylon. And brought it upon us. For the Lord our God is righteous in all the works which he does, though we have not yet obeyed his voice. Notice we obey, obey, obey all the way through. The problem with them, the problem with us is obedience. It is better to obey than to sacrifice. In, in 1 Samuel chapter 15, you can get that. It's better to obey than to sacrifice. We always want to make sacrifices to God, or we're going to say, Lord, if you allow me to do this, I'll give you this. Or I promise. How many promises have we broken? You know what? Just say, Lord, I, you know, I'm going to try my best to do this, and, and if I fail, Lord, please help me. But to make a promise and not to keep it, there are consequences to pay. So we have to be careful. Even as here Daniel is declaring the word of God, he says before the Lord our God that we might turn from our iniquities and understand your truth. Verse 14, therefore the Lord has kept disaster in mind and brought it upon us for the Lord our God is righteous in all the works which he does. Check this out. Though we have not obeyed his voice. Being obedient to the voice of God. And then here Daniel again, verse 15. Daniel's going to conclude his prayer in a moment. And he's going to conclude with a plea for God to forgive and to restore Judah. Lord, forgive us and restore our lives. Lord, we've been here 68 years. And Lord, it's time, please, to forgive us and restore our lives. You know, I think how many times we need to pray in the same way for God to restore our lives. We need to learn how to plead with God. Restoration. Pray for our families to be restored, our friends to be restored. But my personal relationship with God, that if I walked away from Him, or I'm pretty distant from Him, then my life will be restored. As I surrender, as I submit, as I repent before God, then God can listen to my prayer. We can't play games with God. We have to be honest with God. Because if we're honest with God, He's always honest with us. And when you come to that place, and I understand in my own life, that when I get on a place where I sin against God, and the devil comes in to condemn me, I don't listen to Satan, I listen to God. And that is what repent, and ask God to forgive me, and to do what God says in His Word. Because many times people come to God, they ask for forgiveness, and they go right back like the dog going to the back to his vomit. Right back to the same sin. If you really mean business with God, then repentant. Be repentant. Stay repentant. So that God can feel you, God can use your life by the power of his Holy Spirit. So when you come to that place every day to pray, somebody asked me the other day, well, how do you pray? Sitting, standing, however you want to do it. But pray. I think many times when you're alone, you know, nobody's around, it's so cool to get on your face before the Lord. There's something about getting on your face before the Lord. Get rid of your phone. Bring your Bible, bring a pencil and paper just in case God speaks to you. Or God brings something to your remembrance that you need to write down. 
And for my life, it's been so awesome because, you know, I'm not saying it becomes spiritual, but I'm telling by my experience, it's so awesome when I spend time without my wife, without my kids, without my grandkids. Sometimes I'll go for a walk or I'll go up my office upstairs, I'll lock the door, and I don't got anybody to come to my office. I just want to spend time with God. You know, th- this morning was a, just something special in my life. I got up early. My wife had to uh, go to the doctor to get a shot for her cancer. So I went upstairs, and I just started reading my Bible and started reading my devotions. And, and I thought, you know what, God? I just pray for the church, Lord. I pray for my sons. I pray for my granddaughters, my grandsons, for the church, Lord God, I pray. And you're, you ever pray where the, the Lord comes and you start weeping? I never whip in my life before. But I, since I became a Christian, you can call me a weak Christian, a sissy Christian. I find, I'll accept that. I'm a sissy for Christ. But it was so awesome. I was sitting there and something was burning in my heart. I don't know why. Something was burning in my heart. And I couldn't stop crying. I could not stop crying. I go, Lord, what do you want to share with me? And prepare me for tonight for the lesson. You know, we need more Daniels. We need more Marthas. We need more Esthers. We need more Ruths in the church. That as we stand like Daniel here, we stand before the Lord and we're confessing our sins. And we're asking the Lord, Lord, touch me. I want to hear your voice. I want you to use my life. Lord, mold me, break me. Make me into your image, O oh Lord. And you know what? It's so awesome when the real Holy Spirit gets a hold of your life. Very dangerous to drive under the influence of the Holy Spirit. You may crash. But you know that it's the Lord. It's the Lord the way he does things. And I've learned a lot through this prayer in my life. I love chapter 9 because the first thing I go is to that prayer so that I can understand the word of God and what he's going to say for the future. He says again, verse 16, he says, O Lord, according to all your righteousness, I pray, let your anger and your fury be turned away from your city, Jerusalem. Remember, the Jerusalem was so desolated. I mean, they tore it down. They burned the walls out. It was a mess. Your holy mountain, because of our sins. No, they, they, he knows why it happened. And for the iniquities of our fathers past to the present. Notice, to our fathers, Jerusalem, and your people, our reproach to all those around us. Now, therefore, again, our God, hear the prayer of your servants. No, singular. The servant, Daniel, now. Therefore, our God, hear the prayer of your servant, not personal with, between him and God. And his supplications, plural. And for the Lord's sake, cause your face to shine on your sanctuary, which is desolate. Lord, bring your Shekinah glory again over your house. Over your house. When you go back to the Old Testament, and you go to the book of 1 Samuel, when God says, Ichabob, the Lord's power or the Lord's spirit has departed. No more. And you can go around this country and you can go to churches that are one time filled with the Holy Spirit, hundreds and thousands of people, and today they're gas stations, apartments. They've been bought by somebody else and there's no longer a church there. But I would pray that this church would continue on through the teaching of the Word of God, you know, praying to the Lord, making sure that we evangelize people so they can come to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, but that we would be full of love, full of God's love. That if any of us have left our first love, that we would return that we will return to the first love that God's given to us. And that's to love him so that we can love other people. And to understand that every single day may be my last day. Just like Daniel. 
Daniel said, I'm old now, and, you know, and I'm going to die pretty soon, but Lord, I've been here 68 years. You said 70 years. Am I going to see the 70 year? And then the Lord speaks to him and says, Daniel, I'm not going to show you your present. I'm going to show you the future, what's going to happen. He goes on in verse 18. Oh, my God, incline your ear here. Open your eyes and see our desolations. And the city which is called by your name. For we did not present our supplications before you because of our righteous deeds, but because of your great mercies. Underline that. The reason of this prayer, because of your great mercies, O Lord. You are so graceful, Lord. You are so merciful, Lord. Verse 19, his final plea now. O Lord, hear, O Lord, forgive, O Lord. Listen and act. Do not delay for your own sake, my God, for your city and your people are called by your name. Isn't that amazing? Oh, Lord. Three times he uses here. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Oh, Lord. Hear, forgive, listen. Three things. Lord, please listen. Give an ear to hear me, Lord. Lord, forgive me. Forgive me for what I've done today. Prepare me for tomorrow, Lord. And Lord, I beg you by your mercies that you please listen to me, Lord. As I come before your presence, Lord, please listen to me. And help me to act, help me to live the way you want me to live, oh God. Help me to act like a Christian. And then he says, do not delay for your own sake. Please do it as quickly as you can, Lord. My God, personal, my God. For your city, Jerusalem, and your people which are called by your name. We are called what? Christians. Christ-likeness. Or Christ-likeness. We belong to Christ. And then here is God's answer, beginning with verse 20 to verse 27. God says, angel Gabriel. He says, verse 20, Now while I was speaking and praying, so here you are, you're praying, you're speaking and confessing my sin and the sin of my people Israel and presenting my supplication before the Lord, my God, personal, my God, for thy holy mountain of my God. Verse 21, Yes, while I was speaking in prayer, a man Gabriel, whom I have seen in the vision at the beginning being caused to fly swiftly, reached me about the time of the evening offerings. Can you imagine? You're praying, and there's Gabriel. Second, Gabriel and Michael are the archangels of God. And here Gabriel is sent also when Mary was going to have a baby, remember, to Joseph, to kind of share with him that she's going to have a baby boy. And, and you think about the prophecy that Daniel is going to receive here. Man, I don't know if I could handle that prophecy. Because you're sitting there and you're saying, Lord, I pray for today, not for tomorrow. I just wanted you to tell me what's going to happen to us, but I wasn't really expecting you to tell us what's going to happen in the future. And that's something that we need to know and to understand, especially in the days that we're living in. He goes, verse 22, And then Gabriel informed me and talked with me, and said to me, O oh Daniel, I have now come forth to give you skill to understand. God has sent me, so I'm going to give you a message that you are going to understand. Verse 23. At the beginning of your supplications, now notice what he says, at the beginning when you started praying, the command went out, and I have come to tell you, for you are greatly beloved. Isn't that cool? You're greatly beloved, therefore consider the matter and understand the vision. Hey, we are well beloved in heaven. I love that. I marked in my Bible. You're well beloved, therefore consider the matter and understand the vision that I'm going to give to you. Here comes the vision now. Verse 24. Seventy weeks I determined for your people. Who's that? Israel. And for your holy city, Jerusalem, 
to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, and to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring an everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy one. So I'm talking about past, present, and the future, he says. The 70 weeks here is 490 years. 490 years. You multiply 70 times 7, 490 years. It's important that we understand this because what he's going to give, now he's going to break it down. Verse 25. And I, and I told you at the beginning, in Nehemiah chapter 2, uh, March 14, 445 BC, the command was given for him to return to Jerusalem. Well, now, what's coming now, he's going to talk to him not only about the 49 years, but he's going to talk to him now about the next 483 years that will come. Look what he says again. Verse 25. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command, where was that? Nehemiah chapter 2 verse 1. From the first going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem, Nehemiah went for how long? For 12 years to rebuild what? Jerusalem. He says, until Messiah the Prince, there shall be seven weeks 49 years, and 62 weeks, 483 years, the street shall be built again, and the wall even in troublous times, speaking of Jerusalem, being rebuilt. So if you want to read Psalm 118, it's the Masonic Psalm, and then if you want to read when Jesus entered into the city of Jerusalem, it's in Mark chapter 20, verse 1 through 11. And then he says, verse 26, and after 62 weeks, Notice, Messiah shall be what? Killed. He's speaking of the future. Jesus is going to die. But not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary to the end of it shall be in a flood until the end of the war. Desolations are determined. The prince here is in reference to the Roman Empire, Nero. To the Roman Empire. They would come and they would destroy the city of Jerusalem, remember? 70 AD. And the end of it shall be with a flood until the end of war, desolation are determined. So now, verse 27, he says, this is interesting. He says, Then he shall confirm a covenant with many for one week. What's that? The last week, seven years. But in the middle of the week, what's that? The middle of the tribulation period. Seven years, right in the middle. We've talked about this many times. He shall bring an end sacrifice, an offering, and on the wing of the abomination shall be one who makes desolate, even unto the consummation which is determined, I pour out, notice, on the desolate. Here he's talking that in the last seven years, the Antichrist will come. He will rule. You got to read Revelation chapter 13 to understand the false prophet and the Antichrist. The tribulation period, if you want to read it in its text, you read Revelation chapter 6 to chapter 19. Seven years. And you'll see everything that is going to take place, the judgments that are coming. By the way, in the first three and a half years, judgments are very light. But the last three and a half years, they are heavy. That's why it's called the Great Tribulation Period. The Great Tribulation Period. The first three and a half years will be when the Antichrist will give permission to the Jews to rebuild their temple. Which they will rebuild it. So for three and a half years, the Antichrist is getting very acquainted with the world, with the Jews, with people. And then all of a sudden, three and a half years pass. Remember uh, Revelation 13 where they receive the mark of the beast? Nobody can eat, buy, or do whatever unless you have the mark of the beast. In the middle of the tribulation, the Antichrist goes into the temple that is rebuilt. And he sits in the temple, he says, I am God, worship me. Now, by the way, when Jesus enters the city of Jerusalem on a donkey, 
from Nehemiah chapter 2 to enter the city of Jerusalem, 483 years were fulfilled. So 483 years in the last seven years, right here. The Antichrist ruling the church is gone. We're not here any longer. In the middle, the Jews actually, Antichrist comes into the temple. He sits down. He says, I am God. Their eyes are open. And they say, well, this is a false messiah. And they start moving towards Petra, the city of Petra, the city of rock. So if this is Jerusalem behind me, it's Jericho, and then in Jordan also is where the city of Petra is, and that city has already been prepared for the Jews. Prepared already. Because I've been to Petra maybe three times. It's an incredible place. You go there and you, you can go by car or by bus. You can either, either walk or go by mule or by camel. And when you go to the city of Petra, it's a small canyon that you walk through, very narrow. But as you're walking very narrow, all of a sudden you come to this area where it opens up. And when it opens up, you have this huge, huge city, the city of rock. Amazing city that God has prepared for the Jews in the tribulation period. And if you know prophecy, what does he say? When the Jews go to the city of Petra, he will seal the city of Petra where nobody will be able to hurt the Jew. First of all, two-thirds of the Jewish nation, according to the book of Hosea, are killed by who? The Antichrist. Only one-third will survive in the middle of the tribulation period, and they'll head on over to the city of Petra. They will be there until Jesus comes at the second coming. They will not be in Jerusalem any longer. And Jesus Christ will come. The first thing that will happen at the second coming of Christ, you know what that is, right? Armageddon. There in the city, you, you've been with us to the valley of Megiddo, where Elisha stood up on that Mount Carmel. You look down across the way is Nazareth, and you see this huge valley that the Bible says in the book of Revelation 16, that one day the nations of the world will be gathered together and there's going to be a major war. And the Bible says that as this major war, as Christ is coming back, they're going to look up and every eye shall see him. And the Bible says what? They're going to try to fight against Jesus. How deceived are they? The Lord wipes them out. There's going to be 180 to 200 miles of blood. Men's blood. You know how high? Five feet deep. From there, Jesus will go over to the Mount of Olives. Where did he depart at the first coming? From the Mount of Olives. The same way he comes back. He goes to the Mount of Olives. He comes down on the Mount of Olives. And the Mount of Olives splits in half. In the middle of the Mount of Olives, there's a stream way down below. When he splits the Mount of Olives, you guys that went with us, the Dead Sea, when the stream begins to pour out and go not forward, but go backwards to the city there, Jericho, and to Jericho to get to the Dead Sea, which nothing grows today, the lowest part of the world, there, as you sit there, the water will touch the Dead Sea, and the Dead Sea will be healed. And in the kingdom age, the thousand-year reign of Christ, they're going to be able to go there and to fish. They will be able to fish there. Fishing. Nothing gross today. Nothing at all. Man, it's so amazing how God's word is so complete. So complete. And when Jesus comes at the second coming, as he sets up his kingdom, according to Matthew chapter 25, you got to read it. The judgment when Jesus judges who's going to go into the kingdom age and who's not. And those that enter into the kingdom age, they're going to be the ones that did not receive the mark of the beast. Did not receive it. Gentile Jew. Why? Because in the kingdom age, we're going to have our glorified bodies. But in the kingdom age, God is going to allow husband and wives to be married and to have children for a thousand years. Imagine that. Can you imagine the population in a thousand years? But then this is sad. 
Because at the second coming of Christ, the first thing he does, he takes a devil, puts him in the bottom of the spit, and locks him up for a thousand years. The next thing that he does, after the thousand year reign of Christ, the door, one more time, the lock will be unlocked. Where sin will be let out one more time. And when Satan is let out one more time, God wants to check the hearts of the people. So he allows them to go and tempt the people to see how many truly believe in him. How many truly want to go to heaven? Believe it or not, you read the scriptures, hundreds and millions of people turn against Jesus. And then what happens? Read Revelation chapter 20, 11 through 15, the white throne judgment. In the white throne judgment, the books are going to be open. Hell is emptied out. Every person that ever died, they come to the actual sitting where Jesus is sitting at the white throne judgment. The books are open, and there's a line of people. And this is what he says, and whoever's name was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire forever and ever and ever, which is the second death. Heavy, heavy stuff's coming. That's why it's so important for us to understand what the Bible teaches. 490 years, 483 years already fulfilled. And for 1900 years, we've been waiting for the clothing of the last, what, of the last seven years. So the last 1900 years, I will say this, the grace of God. The grace of God. And there is a generation that will never die. And when the Lord comes for that generation, immediately the last seven years of world history will begin, and then the end of the world will come. After a thousand years, then what happens? The new heavens and the new earth. Seven is the number of perfection. Eight is the number of new beginnings. Seven days in the week, on the eighth day we start a new week. Isn't that cool? And we will be with Jesus forever and ever and ever and ever. Father, thank you so much for your word, Jesus. Lord, thank you so much for your people, Lord. Lord, I pray that the Holy Spirit would continue to lead us and guide us, Lord. And that everything we do, everything we say, Lord God, would be according to your will, Jesus. Lord, I pray for the weak. I pray, Father, for the sick. I pray, Father, that you touch your people, anoint them, use them, Lord. Lord, help us to understand your word. Help us to live according to your word, Jesus. And Lord, I pray that you baptize us tonight with the Holy Spirit before we leave here, Lord, so that you would receive all the glory, all the honor, Jesus. And Lord, I pray for my wife, for my grandchildren, Lord God, for my sons, my daughter-in-laws, Lord God. Father, for these beautiful saints, Lord God. For Calvary Chapel, Lord, I pray. For the staff, the volunteers, Lord God. And Lord, we ask you now that as we depart, that we not forget, Father, what we've learned here today, Lord God. And Lord, we thank you once again for your love and grace and mercies. In Jesus' name we pray these things. And everyone said, Amen. Let's all stand. A lot of people are saying today, theologians, that the rapture is never going to happen. It doesn't speak about it in the Bible. Paul the Apostle declared that there's a generation that will never die. They will never die. Whether we are that generation or whoever, it doesn't really matter to me. I know in whom I believe. And I know where I'm heading. And when Pastor Chuck Smith was teaching about the coming of the Lord back in the 70s, he always preached with an expectancy of the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why I'm still here. Because when you believe in the coming of the Lord, you're checking your heart all the time because He may come today, He may come tomorrow, He may come next week, next month, but how do you know He's going to come? We don't know the day or the hour, but He knows. We have to be ready to meet the Lord at our own times.